Exclusivity in gaming. When you hear that, you probably think of games like The Last of Us, Pokemon, Halo, and many more. It might be something that gives you a sense of community and pride in the console that you play on, but for others, it's viewed as a net negative for being anti-consumer. It's the way that companies are able to create a reason to play on their platform, but it also creates extreme tribalism that still exists to this day. The console wars happened and Xbox lost in the most pivotal generation with the Xbox One versus the PlayStation 4. This has led to Xbox backing away from the exclusivity war and possibly bringing games like Starfield and Gears of War to other platforms in the future. And that's also led to PlayStation having a massive dominance on the market as they've been able to outcompete Microsoft in the console arena. Exclusivity isn't just in the realms of consoles. We also have exclusivity on PC with games such as Ubisoft titles being sold only on Epic Games for a while. This is the gaming equivalent of the streaming platform wars that we've seen and we know where that leads to. So today I want to talk about exclusivity in games, my history with it, the reason for its existence, the pros and cons, and finally, if the business practice should be stopped altogether. So sit down, grab a cup of tea, and join me in asking the question, is exclusivity ruining gaming? And just before we jump into the topic, make sure to leave a like on this video if you enjoy topics about games and topics within the gaming world. Make sure to subscribe to the channel whilst you're down there, and if you want to join a community of like-minded players who just enjoy talking about anything and everything, then make sure to join the Discord down below. We're currently hosting a game club, kind of like a book club but for games. This month it's RDR2, so make sure to come on by. And lastly, if you do want to support the channel any further, then make sure to go check out the Patreon for just $1 a month. If you want early access to videos like these behind the scenes, and much more, then make sure to check out the Exiled Ones tier instead. Anyway, let's talk about my experience with exclusives growing up. Growing up, I played on a good variety of consoles. However, the three big ones in my early years was the PlayStation 2, Nintendo Wii, and eventually the DS. These were the staples for the consoles that I played growing up, and were the main reason why I played many of the exclusives that those platforms had to offer. From watching my siblings playing Metal Gear games, playing Animal Crossing on the Wii, to then eventually playing most of the Pokemon entries on my handheld DS. All of them played a role in my upbringing, and all of them were also great add-ons to those platforms to give you a reason to play on them. For example, I wouldn't have ever cared about getting the brand new Switches if it wasn't for the likes of Animal Crossing and the Pokemon releases. The biggest area of gaming for me wouldn't have come until the seventh generation of consoles, with the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360. Because I grew up playing on a PlayStation, I had a PS3 first as my older brother had got one, however, there wasn't much to play on it. I played a few different games with the main two that I would always go back to and I always remember with fond memories is Gran Turismo 5, which to this day is still my favourite racing game. I have ever played. Nothing has ever come close for me to that feeling that I got with that game. And the other is Skyrim, which didn't go down that well. My first experience with Skyrim and the only time I played it on the PlayStation 3 was when the game would constantly crash when you get to the chopping block. So anyone who's played the game knows that's very, very early on in the game, literally the first five minutes. And no matter how many times I restarted playing the game, it would do the exact same thing. The other big issue that I had at the time was the lack of co-op, and generally the lack of anyone to play with. Yes, the console had co-op, but I knew next to nobody who actually used a PlayStation 3. And then on one fateful day, I went around one of my friend's houses on his birthday, and I walked in and he was playing Halo 2 on the Xbox 360. This for me was one of the biggest turning points, as I could always remember that moment, and I would hear him talking about his experience of playing Halo. That and what other YouTubers were also saying about it made me interested in wanting to play on Xbox. And around a year later, my birthday came around, and I ended up getting an R2-D2 360 that I still have to this day. This started my first true experience with online gaming, with Halo 3. It was the console that I played games like Assassin's Creed 2 on, and Skyrim properly for the first time. We would play Gears of War, Forza Horizon when that would eventually come out in the Fable franchise. Everything was up for Xbox, and they had done really well within that time, with the lack of price increases and providing a great platform to play on. However, the next generation of consoles changed a lot for the landscape of modern day gaming and exclusivity. The release of the PS4 and Xbox One was single-handedly the biggest moment that decided the fate of these companies, and the way that they do business moving forward. Xbox made the same errors as PlayStation did in the last generation, and that hit them hard. Not only were they struggling in the exclusivity front, with Sony releasing it during that generation, The Last of Us Remastered, God of War, Spider-Man, Horizon Zero Dawn, Bloodborne, Ghost of Tsushima, and many more. While the best that Xbox could release was Halo 5 and Sea of Thieves. 
Chiefs, with the former being one of the worst entries within the Halo franchise. During this time, I picked up both consoles and got into PC gaming. Eventually the Switch came out, which I also picked up, so I was able to play on all of the platforms, but the cost for doing so is ridiculously high. Due to the amount of friends that I had still playing either on PC or on Xbox, my PS5 and PS4 are basically just machines that gather dust, sat to the one side when I want to play the exclusives that come out on that platform. It's so bad for me that I forced myself to get a load of games on the PS4 at the time to justify playing on that platform, but even then, that didn't work due to one big factor, which was playing where my friends were playing. I love single player titles, but nothing beats enjoying the game and just joking around with your friends. The reason I'm mentioning all of this is that it plays a massive role. I'm part of probably a small group within gaming that had a good chunk of my friends staying on Xbox during the 8th generation of console, but for many, the exclusives that Sony offered were good enough to deal with doing that jumping to the other ship and leaving Xbox in the dust. And with that, they're friends as well. Sony did win the console war, and I think it's for two specific reasons which are heavily important, which is social pressure and the exclusivity race. For us to talk about how all of this occurred and how it's affecting us to this day across all of the platforms, we need to dive a little deeper. Discuss why exclusive games exist, the positives and the negatives, and lastly, what is happening to the modern landscape of games, the likes of Xbox backing away from from this race, and choosing to take a different approach for that branch of Microsoft, but one that is not unreliable and incredibly understood by the company at large. Why do exclusive games exist? Well, it's for a few different reasons. The basic reason is to give the platform a competitive advantage. This is why I laid out in my exposing the AAA scam that I'm incredibly anti them being a $70 price tag, as they're getting a ridiculously massive profit margin, but mainly that these games are meant to be the reason that you come to their platform. They're designed by definition to be far more of a loss leader than anything else. With console gaming in particular, the consoles are loss leaders in themselves. For those who who don't know what that means, the simple explanation is that they're willing to make a loss on the product because it means that they can end up getting a fish hook into you for you to buy more of their products and spend even more money with them. These platforms make money from both their exclusive titles, but they also take a minimum of 30 to 42% depending on the licensing fees on third party games that release on their platforms. And however much they also make on top of that from their physical products such as selling $60 controllers or selling you headsets. What I'm saying is that they've made a ton of money from other games sales and those games microtransactions. So I do have a slight issue of them having exclusives at a high price tag when you consider that it's meant to be the main reason or at least the secondary reason that you play on the platform. With the competitive advantage, this builds a form of brand identity through these games releases. And with that, it builds brand loyalty. When you see Halo, Forza, Gears of War and Fable, you think of Xbox. When you see The Last of Us, God of War, Horizon Zero, Dawn and Crash Bandicoot, which is no longer an exclusive to PlayStation, you still think of PlayStation. When you see Pokemon, Zelda and Mario, it will make you think of Nintendo. And when you see CS2, Civ 6, Sims 4, it will all make you think about PC. All of these are incredibly important to the consoles and PC, as they allow these consoles to have some form of brand identity. All of those games that I've mentioned, for the most part, are still exclusive to those platforms. And with those games releases, especially at the time of when they released, it gave you a great understanding as to what those platforms valued in gaming. With Sony, you see a pattern of high quality, story driven games. With Xbox, they always felt like they cared more about the idea of playing a game and enjoying the multiplayer experience. This gives a company an identity that we can link to companies, however, over time, for companies like Xbox, a lot of that has kind of gone to the sidelines and been eroded away by their own incompetence over the last decade, or just got outcompeted by third party studios and Sony. That though is something for later on in the video. You also have the financial incentives. As I mentioned earlier, I'm not a fan of these first party games being as expensive as they are, due to both third party games costing more at many different points, or the same amount as these games, but they're still going to be walking away with far less profit. And those platforms that are selling first party games are still walking away with 42% of that $70 price tag. But that I think isn't important right now. We need to focus on the profit margins that they make on their exclusive games. As I mentioned in my previous video, third party
third-party studios make up around 45% of that $70 price tag. Whereas a company like Sony, when they release a first-party release, walk away with 82% of that sale. They walk away with $57 and 40 cents. This doesn't take into account how much money they'll probably save on the refunds of the game physically, plus physical distribution which has gone down massively with only 10% of all sales being on physical copies in 2022. So these platforms are selling exclusive games for a ton of money, or at least they did for a long time, and now it's a bit iffy. Again, something that I'm going to talk about in a bit. The final of the big four reasons is hardware optimization. With the likes of Sony, they're being able to take full advantage of the PS5 and its dual sense controller. However, the big reason this is important is that it allows them to show off the consoles at their best. For example, Halo Infinite's original release date was meant to coincide with the launch of the Series X. There's two reasons for this, as it will help the next generation console sales if it's an exclusive to those generations, and it also means that people will come through the doors to that console and also pay for things like the games and microtransactions. And the other reason that is connected to this is that it should, in theory, be able to show off the console as best as it can as it's a game that was made from the ground up for this next generation platform. With those types of exclusives, it also brings us to the likes of Ubisoft, which on multiple occasions has done things related to exclusives. Exclusivity. The first time they did this was with Assassin's Creed Unity. This game was made for the next generation of consoles, as it was technologically too advanced for the older generation, but also it gave a reason for people to come onto those next generation platforms. Do I have necessary proof that it is just to push you onto the next generation platform? Not really, but it's kind of obvious when you consider that they released two different games, one for next gen only and one for 360 only. It kind of shows that they wanted to cash in on both fronts. My hunch is that they definitely were telling the truth when it came to the technical limitations, but I also wouldn't have been surprised if both Sony and Xbox made some form of deal with them to make it a next-gen only title from the get-go, as it would help both platforms sell their products, not just the company's games themselves. And with that, it doesn't actually help the sales of the games by being on next-gen only, because at the time, not many people had next-generation consoles just yet. Same as today, where you still see a lot of people holding out on whether or not to get a PS5, as they still don't consider there to be enough on this console to to actually consider upgrading. It's the same issue that we're probably going to see with the likes of GTA 6. We don't know if it's actually going to release on, you know, the Series X and PS5. It could be for the PlayStation 6 and whatever comes after for the Xbox. The other area that you see this exclusivity is with third-party games for different platforms. For example, on PC, you used to only be able to buy Ubisoft titles on Ubisoft Connect or the Epic Games sales front. This hurt their sales enough that they decided not to renew their contract with Epic Games and go back into the Steam ecosystem system and accept them taking that 30% cut. Enough though with the reasons, I wanted to talk about the actual issues with exclusivity in gaming and the world itself of games and how exclusivity plays a role within it. The first place that we have to start is something that is a bit more relevant today than ever. This is the push to go onto the next generation of consoles, when in reality there isn't a massive load of games to really play on these consoles to make it worthwhile. For many out there, this is one of the defining factors to choose what platform you play on. Have we had some amazing games? Yes, of course we have. These consoles, however, are entering into their final half of their lifespan, and not enough games have really come out across this time, with most of them either being very similar to the previous this one's released, some graphical enhancements, or some just being remakes. Sony have definitely put out some amazing games, but there's not enough diversity of choice, and it's something that everyone is seemingly noticing a bit more. Yes, they're amazing quality, however, they all seem to follow a similar sort of pattern. Xbox hasn't had a good exclusive in a long while, and also PC players just gain access to all of them anyway. They also allow access to Game Pass on PC, which isn't a bad thing, but it's something that gives you less of a reason to care about playing on Xbox. The next area that I want to to talk about, and I've always had a form of pushback about it, is tribalism, which normally becomes pretty hostile on the internet. It's kind of amusing to see how seriously people do take the console that they play on. They'll look down on the people who don't play on the same device as them, and on top of that, they'll just hide away from any criticism that the ecosystem gets. You have common phrases such as Xbox, Sony Ponies, and Nintendo. 
bots. These exist for two reasons. One is that you have some groups of players who are willing to just let go of anything bad and just act like it doesn't exist on their platform and completely hide it. And then you've got the other side, which are simply put just happy to play on their console and don't really see any reason to go play on another. The people who can't admit that Sony make great games at the type of exclusives that they go for are simply just lying to themselves, but people who don't admit that they have some pitfalls are also lying to themselves. All of these issues around exclusives are normally within the realms of either economics or socialization. The latter is the issue with this one, especially when you've got people who are so wrapped up in being the defender of their console that you see more of a negative side to tribalism. Tribalism is the other side of the same coin of building a brand's identity and communities. A negative that I've mentioned within this video and in previous videos as well is the cost of these games on launch based on how much they were able to walk away with in comparison to other games out there. You have games that have the same budget walking away with enough to cover and make a little bit of profit on top of it from their 45% cuts, whereas companies like Xbox and Sony are profiting the vast majority of the whole sale of $70. The biggest thing that I heard, especially in my previous video, is that they deserve to make those games and profit as much as they can off of them because they made it, when the reality is, is that just because someone can do something doesn't mean they should do something. If they're able to make the money and save the customers a little bit of extra, it's a win-win for everyone. Why are people defending this? The only reason the prices have increased for exclusives as well is because they know that they can get away with it, as it's completely clouded by what people believe is just price increases because everything's going up. Another negative is that exclusives aren't really staying exclusive anymore. Sure, you might be waiting a couple of years if you want to play the Sony exclusives, but fundamentally, if you own a PC right now, then you could heavily argue in favour of why PC is the platform to play on. This is something that is expensive to get into, but if it means that you can literally play almost every single game that has ever come out and will be coming out in the future, I think it's a worthwhile trade-off. We have companies like Xbox who are looking to walk away from the market of exclusivity altogether, which really is interesting to see. This is something that is good for the general consumer, but let's not forget why this exists. Sony was pushed by Xbox with Game Pass to actually start putting out content into different markets when they made their PlayStation Plus. Another issue is this idea that's related to PC, which is typically most of the console exclusives are made specifically for those consoles first and foremost. They then get ported over to PC and we've seen how half of those come out. It's normally a half-baked win for the consumers because they can play it on their platform that they want to. However, it comes at the caveat of it might not run for the first month or so. Another issue that has become more obvious with the release of the likes of Power World is how locked in and stagnant these big companies are to the titles that they've got and they believe that they are their trump cards. With Nintendo, they believe that something like Pokemon or Zelda or Mario will be good enough reasons for someone to buy a Switch and truly get into the experience when really people do care about playing a good game. Sadly, Pokemon has had a lot of rocky releases over the years, with the last decent one being Sword and Shield, and even then, I will still argue that no other Pokemon game in the entire franchise has come close to being as good as X and Y, which in my opinion, considering that the game has had many entries since, many entries before, which is fair enough why they wouldn't be as good in my mind as X and Y, but the fact that they still haven't been able to beat a game that came out on the 3DS is quite you know, troublesome for the franchise. Now that's a hot take, obviously, of mine, so you guys can argue over it in the comments. With a lack of effort being put in, which is based off the lack of anything you actually see being added to these Pokemon games and genuinely half-baked games. For example, we talk about Jedi Survivor having issues on launch. They sorted it all out, for the most part, within the first month of release. Pokemon Arceus plays like a game that they just said, this is good enough, slapped a sticker on it and said, let's move on to the next thing. Power World has proven that people wanted more of the concept itself. Sure, it's not a Pokemon game, nor is it like any of the Pokemon games within the franchise, but it does two things right. It gave the feeling of Pokemon an arc. Two franchises that fans are itching for something new and grander in scope, and they got that for certain with this game. The fact that some small studio was able to release this game and not Game Freak is insane. Well, maybe not insane, but it's just proof that they're locked into this way of believing that they know what is the right thing to be doing. The customer is always right is a saying that you'll hear a lot of, especially if you work in something like retail or product design. I just think that it's just a load of BS for the most part. I despise it heavily as a concept. However, in some situations, it is definitely right. And I believe in this certain instance, 
it definitely was. And we're seeing this play out over the course of the gaming world. For example, as of the time of recording this video, this is just added in outside of the script, I've started playing Helldivers with some of my friends, and that game is something that, when I'm playing it, the only thing I can think of is why was this not a Star Wars game, or a game made for something like Halo. This game fits both of those worlds so much, but neither one of those companies, well, either one of those entities decided to make a game within that realm, and it's really sad to see. Hopefully we see something like it with Star Wars, I think that'd be really cool. I'm really enjoying my time with Helldivers too, and I think it's just proving that these concepts that people love within these games, it's just weird that they've never been thought of for these bigger franchises that seem too scared to take that leap into a different form of playstyle. A video that I had in the works a long time ago, and I actually made everything for the most part, I never released it though, was a video about this idea of genre jumping within games, let me know if you're interested in it, and it basically focuses on Assassin's Creed primarily. However, I do think genre jumping is a really interesting topic within gaming because you rarely see it within the gaming world, and only some have been able to do it successfully. Let's actually jump back into the video itself and talk about the last negative, which is that it is fundamentally anti-consumer. It's anti-consumer in that it meant that people people for a very long time had to spend a lot of money if they wanted to check out these games on different platforms. But it's also anti-consumer in that it feels as if they need these things to fit in or play the games that they see others checking out, that socialisation and social proof aspect. It creates an awful part of gaming, however it also creates some great parts of gaming. It's anti-consumer in one aspect, but it's also very pro-competition, or at least it used to be. This is something that we're going to talk about soon, but let's first talk about some of the other positives within exclusivity. One of the biggest positives for exclusivity, or at least it used to be, is this heavy focus on making great games. Not just decent games, but great releases. The heavy hitters from the old days of Xbox don't share that in common with many of the releases that we've seen from them in a long time. However, Sony still focus on this idea of this desire to make a great game. Xbox, I would argue, have always focused on making the gameplay aspects as good as they can, and we've seen this over time throughout, for example, the Halo release the Forza releases and whatnot, but Sony have created some of the best cinematic masterpieces we've ever seen in this medium. This is something that we haven't seen in a long while, but it's the same sort of energy that we're now seeing within the indie development section of gaming. This desire to make games that some companies for some reason don't think consumers want to play, you know, we do, and we end up loving them in the process. This last year alone has been proof of that. This is what these exclusives used to be, and in some contexts still are, but fundamentally the gaming landscape has changed and is no longer just these big companies being one of the few who have enough money to make them. Even though I said that this was a form of negative earlier, I also want to talk about the positive aspects of only being able to play on specific platforms and giving you a reason to only play on them. As I said, exclusivity by definition is anti-consumer in one big area, however I believe that these companies need to have more competition if they have the ability to do anything outside of hardware. Especially at a time where neither team really has a technological advantage, so they need to do something else to stand out. The console themselves are already lost leaders for these companies. Software is something new to the gaming industry, but gaming exclusivity isn't, and deals for DLC drops and, you know, other different expansions that you might see within Call of Duty and early releases aren't. This is the only way that these companies have any form of competition with each other and a competitive advantage outside of the likes of Game Pass, but that is also anti-consumer if you're really breaking it down into the idea of what a subscription-based gamer actually means to this market. Market. Again, that is for another video later down the line. Exclusives gives these companies a reason to exist outside of just the hardware. They give a competitive advantage, and if the last decade of console generations are anything to go off of, then Xbox could be looking down the barrel or something very dark for the future of the competition within this space, so hopefully they can do something to pull it back over the next generation. Game Pass is definitely still an issue, however it does have one good thing going for it, which is that if you want to gain access to loads of amazing games with PlayStation Plus or Game Pass, or you know, other equivalent softwares that are definitely in the works, Netflix and whatnot, then you can actually do that, gain access to some of the games on day one that are exclusive to those consoles and platforms, and actually have a good time without having to pay a ton of money up front to do so. You might not own the game outright, but you can end up playing them and finding out if you actually like them or not, and then cancel your membership if you don't like it. 
This is a great thing for many players out there. I do have criticisms of Game Pass, and as I mentioned earlier, that sort of subscription-based gaming is something that I'm going to talk about in a future video. However, when it comes to this idea of the positive aspect, I do think it has an overwhelmingly positive view towards the idea of what being a player actually means. The fact that you can play, you know, on an Xbox for £10.99 a month and gain access to all the games that you have on there, if that existed when I was younger, I would have wanted it straight away, just so that I could have played so many of the games straight off the bat. Even though hardware doesn't see a massive difference between the consoles, there is a big enough one that it ends up allowing people to choose if they want to, you know, play on those certain platforms with those certain exclusives. DualShock is a perfect example of this. Most of the games that released for PlayStation 4 and PS5 will do something in relation with the controller from haptic feedback, audio and adaptive triggers. Sony exclusives are normally the games that try to take full advantage of the hardware, but more importantly, really want to show it off. It's one of those features that is definitely more of a gimmick if you're looking at it from a bird's eye view, but it's enough of one that people definitely look at it as a reason to add on to why these consoles are better than another. With exclusives, they're definitely trying to show off the console at its best, not just the games themselves. The idea of competition, as I mentioned earlier, is the last and probably the biggest pro of exclusivity. We see all of the giants that have massive pockets fighting it out over one another to get people on their consoles. As much as some people may dislike the fact that Xbox players can't play something like The Last of Us, I do also think that a game like The Last of Us probably wouldn't have been released, if I'm being honest, if you think about it a lot of why The Last of Us released. It was one of the big competitive advantages Sony had, which was this amazing cinematic masterpiece. Maybe it would have come out, maybe it would have gone on to all of the consoles and sold really well, but it's fundamentally was made as a PlayStation exclusive, and it was one of the biggest selling points of getting a PS3 and a PS4. For as much as people rip into Starfield, it's probably one of the most polished BGS games we've ever seen, and it has done pretty well for itself. That only happened though because of the acquisition. Xbox wanted a game to come out that wasn't completely awful and broken right off the bat. Exclusivity is anti-consumer in some ways, but it also helps studios and companies that want to do a bit more but can't due to the monetary limitations. For example, we saw Bethesda doing a lot more stuff before getting acquired by Xbox to actually afford to do a lot of the things that they wanted to do, and also make themselves look better for a future acquisition down the line. These things have to be done for companies to stay afloat, we saw it with the likes of Bungie, we've seen it with plenty other companies as well, and it allows these big studios to come in and lift out smaller companies to truly develop games that aren't just the same game released every single time. It's time for us to talk about the biggest change that has been slowly shifting in the background for quite a while now, which is the change from full-on exclusivity to a world where more players are being able to play and enjoy games with one another and just different platforms games that at one point were only available to some. The first place to start is going to be of Xbox and their choice to back away from the exclusivity race by making at least four games available on multiple platforms. As only a few weeks ago it was leaked and then announced that Xbox were planning to move four games from being exclusive to Microsoft to available for everyone, with one of the big games in that list that people think and is being speculated to be is Sea of Thieves, which is going to be really interesting to see how it all stacks up. The reason for these changes is pretty simple its money. Does this mean that they should be doing it? Well again, I think this depends on your idea of whether or not exclusivity matters. You have one side that will view this as walking towards a good direction and a pro-consumer aspect of gaming. You'll then have the other side that questions why they even purchased an Xbox or used Microsoft services on PC in the first place. Now the reason that this is happening, as I said, is due to finances, with one big issue being their inability to recoup money. Xbox has gone on a massive spending spree, as we all know. This isn't something that is financially sustainable, so they're looking to slow down on the acquisitions and focus on the games themselves. You have new games in the works, and some of the ones that were remaining being taken onto other platforms. Sure, it's only starting with four games, but it's definitely not going to be the last four to be sent over. I doubt we'll be seeing the likes of Halo move over to something like PlayStation, but honestly, it's at a point right now where it's kind of up in the air as to who knows what Xbox's future will be. Xbox, though, are fighting a different war. They admitted in their deal to get Activision Blizzard that they had lost the console war, and that meant that they had lost the console sales, but it didn't mean that they lost the software war. We all know that Xbox are trying to push towards a subscription-based future, with the likes of Game Pass being their leader at the helm within that entire subcategory 
category of gaming. A win for them would be if Sony says yes to it being on their platform, however, the cost of Game Pass is a hidden one for most. For as much as people think that Starfield failed, it did its primary job which was to get more people on Game Pass and get people on Game Pass to play more Game Pass. But what screws them over the most is that these games still cost a lot to make. Sony right now have the best of both worlds, as they can get people to purchase the games right off the jump, and then if they want to save their money and not get the game on release, they can just wait two years and play it on PlayStation Plus. So yes, even though Game Pass brings in Xbox a ton of money every single month, like a absurd amount of money every single month, but it still doesn't change anything that after all of the acquisitions they've done over the last like three to five years, they are still running in a massive deficit. But let's talk about Sony for a moment, as it's not just Microsoft making any changes to this space. Sony chose a few years ago to allow PC players to gain access to their exclusives, a move that nobody ever thought would happen. Sony never does this, but after years of pressure, they did cave. They didn't cave to PC players themselves, but the market of subscription-based gaming, and with that, PC players now have the best of both worlds. The word exclusive doesn't really mean the same thing as it once did. It now means that we can get a game early, but others will get access to it eventually. Which brings this entire question of, what's the point of playing on a console in the first place, when you could just buy a PC? This is a question for you to decide. The two biggest reasons against it would be that the price of getting into PC gaming is very strong, and as well if you don't have many people to play with on PC, that's another big issue. However, it's now at a point where in gaming, you could just buy a PC, have some pay patience, and you'll be able to gain access to everything and do everything you've ever wanted to when it comes to playing every game possible. Something that isn't true to the Sony ponies and Xbox. Sony doing this shows that in some way making their exclusives available on other platforms is worthwhile. I think as of right now we don't see the full story on whether or not it's actually a good thing for these companies, as I've already mentioned that these companies do care about brand identities and building a community. And all of that identity and community hinges on exclusives. People rarely say, I play because I like this console. They typically say, I play because I like their games, or because that's where my friends play. This means that the word exclusive and where people play is becoming more and more blurred by the day. We're seeing PC become the place to play games if you're just a fan of games in general, but the console is still able to keep a big size of the market to themselves due to a couple reasons. One is that, you know, it's easier entry to get into, and also for the most part it's more of a relaxed way to play games. It's something that people might think is pro-consumer, and it is to an extent, but it's also something that could change the landscape of gaming forever, and it's an unknown of what we are walking into. Who knows where all of this exclusivity and the end of exclusivity will go. There's this idea that it's better to spend time with the devil you know than the one that you don't. Is this always true? Not necessarily. But I do think, in this case, it could lead to a world where we end up having consoles that have pretty much no difference in utility, and they're just hoping people play on their console. We're going to see more of a push over the next decade to not owning the games themselves and becoming a monthly spender on top of that. It's an extremely mixed bag, but after discussing a load of ideas around exclusivity, I wanted to give some of my thoughts on the actual concept itself and what I see moving forward. I'm not ultimately opposed to exclusivity. I don't know if it's because it's created some of the fondest memories I have, with one of my favourites being when I was younger, sitting on the little table in the lounge and playing Animal Crossing or Mario Planet on the Wii. I love many of the exclusive games that we've seen from all of the areas of gaming, from the likes of Ubisoft selling AC for a few years over on Epic to Halo 2 and 3. A lot of these games, I think, are some of the best times I've ever had within the world of gaming. All are either exclusive games or have at one point had a form of exclusivity and a deal made that I was able to take advantage of. So it is a very hard one for me to say as I do love many of the games that I've played that are exclusives to these platforms and it does give you a reason for these consoles to exist and why you would play on their platform. However, we all know that it's not a pro-consumer move. I don't think Xbox bringing their exclusives to other platforms such as PlayStation is the answer. However, I also don't think that it's an awful choice. Sony, as of right now, probably does exclusive 
exclusivity the best possible way outside of not allowing it onto Xbox. I think that would be an even better way. And I think this is what we'll see moving forward. In the future, what I believe should be the case for exclusive games is that they should release only on their native platforms on launch, or for example, with Xbox on the Microsoft Store and Xbox Store as they do. Then after a couple of years, they'll become available on all platforms, not just PC. This will force competition in different ways from the likes of Xbox already offering day one exclusives to Game Pass, but also focusing on making games the experience of playing these games better instead of just trying to argue over whose ecosystem is better, when in reality, they can do a lot of these different things. What I mean by having that little bit of an advantage with day one exclusivity is something that I think a lot of them will back away from purely because Sony are able to get away with at least getting a load of sales in through the door and then people can sign up to, you know, PlayStation Plus down the road when that game eventually comes out on there. But the state that we are moving towards is a double-edged sword. On one side, we have the pro-consumer push towards games being available on more platforms like we're seeing with Xbox, but on the other side, we see brand identities being stripped away and possibly the future of a monopolization of the market. I think the future of exclusivity isn't much of a future at all. The last three generations of consoles have played a role into the console wars and cemented Sony as the champion, which has caused Xbox to change what they believe is the future of gaming. Subscriptions and mobile gaming. Yes, we are still seeing indie, AA and AAA games, but the future of gaming is no longer going to be fought on the grounds of exclusivity for these big giants in the industry. But in fact, on who has better software and who offers better value for money gaming services and experiences. With that all being said, I think that's where I'm going to leave today's video. Let me know what your thoughts on exclusives are and whether or not you think moving away from them is a good thing. This video has definitely pushed me as well to start working on a different video, which might go up on this channel. I'm not 100% sure. It will either go up on this one or the second channel. As I mentioned in the previous one, I've made a second channel. Go check it out. Chatting with Exile. It'll be linked down below. It's going to be a video probably about uh, this idea of just playing some games that I played growing up and making a video discussing those and around nostalgia and whatnot. I think it'll be interesting to do. But with all that being said, if you did enjoy the video, make sure to leave a like on this video if you do enjoy this sort of content. And whilst you are down there, make sure to hit the subscribe button as well. If you want to join a like-minded group of players and just people to chat with, make sure to also come and join the Discord. And if you want to support the channel any further, check out the Patreon for early access to content like this and plenty more things as well. With that all being said, I'll see you in the next one. Have a good one.